Hey, what is up? My name is Josh, and I want to welcome you to Cokesbury Church. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. However you found us, man, we're so glad that you did. We can't wait to worship with you. Hey, just a quick reminder, if you are in the Knoxville area, we have returned to in-person worship. Uh, to join us, we, would, we ask that you make a reservation. The easiest way to do that is to get on your Cokesbury app, select a service you want to attend, click reserve, and then we will see you at 10 o'clock on either the North or South campus. Well, that's in-person worship, but right now, and we're going to get started. Stephen Defer is continuing our series, Found. We can't wait to get into that, but before we get there, let's join the band with the great song, King of Glory. Hey church, we talk all the time about how thankful we are that you are a generous people. And again, we say 
thank you. Uh, there are a few ways that you can give. You can text to give, you can give on the app or just online, or you can mail in your offering. Church, your giving absolutely makes a difference. In just a moment, you're gonna meet Natalia, and she has a wonderful story about how Cokesbury Church has made a difference in her life. My name is Natalia Hardin. Uh, I got connected to Cokesbury the first time um, when my mom, who everybody knows, I guess, as Miss Irina in the nursery, said that I could come by when Mia was about two. Um, so we would come by here and um, kind of got acclimated to it, uh, but it wasn't until much, much later that we started actually coming to the services. I remember coming to Cokesbury when I was really little, like my mom said, because um, my grandma, Miss Irina, she would like let me come and play like uh, in the nursery with all the other little kids and stuff. Then around last year, like in the end of the year kind of, I was thinking like we need to start going to church more and like I know this is a really good church so maybe we should try it. And then I was like we should start going here and so yeah, now we're going here. We'd been coming here on Sundays uh, at the 10 o'clock service um, so that Lola could start going to the classes as well. So we started going um, consistently. Um, it was something that became, you know, 10 o'clock Sunday morning so we'd come to church. And then actually, once again, uh, kind of next steps, it was Mia who asked me one day over dinner, I think it was, she said, you know, how do we join? How do we become actual members? Um, which I couldn't answer because I, I didn't know. So I reached out. We got the email. We didn't have like the dinner that I guess they usually do. Um, and we joined via Zoom. We, we thought it was special, so we still got dressed up and, yeah. uh, and sat in the kitchen and did a Zoom call and, and you know, went through everything and, and formally joined, yeah. I think the, the biggest part was seeing, seeing it through my daughter's eyes. I think that was the, the final true kind of calling that I felt being here, that this felt like the right place for us. They were understanding more about religion and God and how to grow in that than I've ever seen them before. And, and I really think that kind of pushed me even further to become, to become members because I, I want that for them. I want them to have that, that background and be able to grow with that. Um, and just seeing it through their eyes was really, really inspiring to be able to, to continue with it. Hey everybody, welcome in. My name is Stephen Defer. I'm the senior pastor here at Cokesbury. Hope you're doing well this weekend. Hope you've had a chance to pump the brakes and catch your breath after we've had a very busy week. We're in this series called Found and we're talking about how um, during this season that we all find ourselves in, it's so easy to focus on the things that we've all lost. But the reality is there's a lot of things that we can find along the way. And in fact, we've built this whole series on this story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. And it kind of strikes at the heart of what is God's motivation. It's this idea that God wants to be with us, right? That God actually wants to know us and to love us and to kind of cleanse us of our sins, to walk us through our brokenness, and ultimately to set us free so that we're unencumbered as we live this one and only life that we have. And so this story is powerful, man. It's, it's centered on this father who has two sons, and the younger son comes to him one day and asks for his inheritance early. And so the father grants his wish, and the younger son goes off, and he lives his life. And it's this whole story of how once it doesn't work out for the younger son, the dad welcomes him home and it reminds us that God is about creating this community of the redeemed, right? That, that God's people are not perfect, that we make mistakes, that sometimes we fall flat on our face. And yet, because of God's goodness, we're all called to be a part of this redemptive community called the church. And so we learned last week that one of the things that we can find during the season is a sense of, of deep connectedness and community with each other, even if you have to step outside what we normally would consider actual community. And you have to find unique ways of doing that. But that can be a blessing, that we're not left alone, that you and I can connect with each other and we can connect with God. 
What's great about this story is it, it continues. There's a whole nother part of it. And so today we're gonna pick up in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 25. So if you wanna pull up another browser, you can do that. If you wanna go old school and open up a Bible, Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Here's what Jesus says. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brothers come home, he replied, and your father's killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. See, just like the father went out last week and welcomed the younger son, now he's going out to talk to the older son. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. It's an interesting story. Jesus uses the two brothers to kind of present this choice that you and I can either make a point in life or we can make a difference. And make no mistake about it, the younger brother got his inheritance, right? Like he made this long series of bad decisions, but eventually he recognized his mistake and he began to make his way home. But the older brother who followed all the rules, who stayed in his lane, right? who tried to always do the right thing, who didn't make any really rash, bad decisions, he ended up missing the opportunity to participate in the father's celebration because he was too busy being offended. I think it really is the quintessential choice that we all have to make. Am I gonna make a point, which you can do that, or am I actually going to make a difference? Now here's the deal. You and I live in a culture in fact, I would argue we're actually caught in a moment where it's all about pointing that finger and making that point. And for those of us who are trying to actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we've got to realize we're called to be different. We're, we're in the culture, but we're not of the culture. The Apostle Paul talks about this in his first letter to the church at Corinth. And today, check this out. We're actually going to cover over the next few minutes three chapters in this book. Now, don't check out, don't go on Amazon, don't start shopping. We're gonna get through it quickly, but there's some powerful stuff here. In fact, there is a ton of stuff in here and it would be impossible to cover all of it just in the context of this message. So what I would do is encourage you, just kind of check it out and study um, those three chapters later today. It's really great stuff. You could literally build your life on these three chapters. But with that said, there's this overarching theme. It's, it's this overarching driver that Paul, Paul points to that really defines this idea of being different. Check this out. This is from 1 Corinthians 9. We're gonna pick up in verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that fades away. We do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I actually discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. That is a fascinating analogy. Now what you have to understand about Paul, especially if you don't know a lot about him, is he wasn't one of these guys who just kind of skated through life. And we all know people like that, right? You just sort of wake up one day and you hope to get through that day. And at the end of the day, if you've made it through unscathed, you kind of feel good about that and you repeat the whole process. That's not the way Paul lived his life. He actually took Jesus at his word and he believed that one day Jesus was actually gonna return and when he shows up, he's gonna set things right. And Paul was absolutely convinced that this was not some kind of vague, 
um, grandiose idea to make people feel better. He was sold out to the idea that this was gonna happen in his lifetime. And so because of that, Paul lived every single moment of his life as if that was gonna be the last day he spent on this planet. And so he was wide open without holding anything back. And his expectation was that the churches that God was beginning to establish, that they would live their lives the same way. So what I'm trying to say is, there was this deep sense of urgency. And what Paul is saying is simple. Every human being, every man, every woman, every child is running a race. We're all competing to build our life on something. And it is our one and only life. What we get, whether it's 10 years or 50 years or hopefully like 110 years, it really is the only shot that you and I get. So what Paul is saying is you gotta be very careful how you live out that one and only life. Or to put it another way, make sure you're actually running the right race. Have you actually thought about that? See, here's the deal. You and I can run a lot of races. We live in a world where people walk up to the starting line every single day. Most of us are actually gonna do it tomorrow morning. Our culture is a driven and fast paced where standards are really, really high. And we are judged every single day. Think about this, you guys know this. We're, just, we're um, judged by our earning capacity, we're ju judged by the neighborhood we live in, or what we drive, or where our kids go to school, or the type of people that we hang out with. And if we're honest about it, most of us are willing to pay almost any price to ensure that we win that race, and that's fine. You can run those kind of races if you want to. It's just that when the race comes to an end, when our life actually closes out, my fear is that many of us won't really have any substance to show. And we do it all the time. Some of us are willing to spend our entire lifetime building our lives on somebody else's opinion of us or, or certain images that we want to portray. We can build our lives on things like money or power or sex or maybe something like status. We can spend our entire life of time and energy and resources just simply chasing after somebody else's approval. And what Paul is saying to the church is, Make absolutely sure that what you're building your one and only life on actually matters. Are you running a race that pursues that which is temporary? Or as Paul puts it, are you running a race that is built on something that's eternal? Something that's gonna live way beyond yourself. Something that's gonna impact not just your kids and your grandkids, but maybe their kids and their kids. See, either way we choose to live our life, it really is a possibility. I can build a self-focused life. And sure, I can mask it so that it's not so obvious. But I can, I can actually build a life that is totally focused on my comfort and my satisfaction, on my success, and on my sense of happiness and fulfillment. Or I can be intentional and I can position myself to build a life on something beyond myself, something that's bigger, something that's more significant, something that is much more fulfilling, that is actually a lot more rewarding. We can actually have a life that is lived on purpose. So what I wanna do is dig into these three chapters in 1 Corinthians, because I think there's a lot of insight into how you and I can learn to build the right kind of life. In chapter eight, there's this discussion about idols and what you do with the food that gets offered to them. Now, Paul's addressing a church that's different than our churches, right? Like idolatry was a big deal in Paul's day and, and I don't want us to get all bogged down in that idolatry stuff because nobody has idols in our day, right? Here's what I want you to see, verse four. Paul writes, so what about eating meat that had been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and that there's only one God, there may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and from whom we live. So Paul's already setting the standard right now. 
And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. Verse seven. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when we eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It is true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat and we don't gain anything if we do. Now here it is. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. You must be careful. In other words, what Paul is saying is, look, we know these idols aren't real. They're just, there's only one God, right? So in the grand scheme of things, whether you eat the meat or not, it's really not that big of a deal. But if what you do confuses somebody or it stands in the way of them knowing God, then it's really not worth doing. To put it in more practical terms, what Paul is saying is you got to live your life based on purpose and not on preference. It's huge. You got to live your life based on purpose and not on preference. Our purpose for those of us who are following Jesus is to allow ourselves to be a conduit. It's allowing God to use us so that other people can see Jesus in us. And that means that we've got to pay attention to how we live. Because whether we want it to be true or not, our lives really are a testimony. The life that you're living right now, it is a witness for those around us. This is not about being a good person, nor is it about trying to be perfect. Because both of those are an impossibility. But what it is about, it's actually learning to exercise what I call situational awareness, right? Don't do anything that willingly causes a contradiction. So that means sometimes you gotta pay attention to how you act. That means sometimes you gotta think about the words before they come out of your mouth. That means every once in a while you ought to pump the brakes before you hit send and, and think about what you're about to post or what you're about to email. That means you can't gather together for church and be all righteous and then venture out to lunch and treat your waiter or waitress like trash. See, our actions, the words that we speak, everything speaks volumes to others about what we believe. So if we're gonna hang out with Jesus, our preference has to take a back seat to our purpose. Paul leans into this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. <clears throat> he says, even though I am a free man with no master, I become a slave to all people so that I can bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, to the law I did this so I could bring Christ to those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I don't ignore the law, I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness for I wanna bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. Now here it is, verse 23. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessings. See, following Jesus ought to radically redirect our priorities. That's just the truth. If you're the same person you were when you started following Jesus, you may not be making much progress. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you can't make mistakes. In fact, I would say, I'm not near the person that I know God needs me to be, but I'm a long way away from who I used to be. That's progress. That's allowing God, as years tick by, to begin to reorient our priorities and refocus us on how we should live our lives. It's true for us, and it's also true for the church. And here's what I believe. I believe the church's greatest enemy is not the devil. I don't think it's a complacent government, and I don't think it's a disinterested culture. I think the greatest enemy of the church may actually be 
those of us in the church. It might actually be Christians. See, we gotta fight to be a public church. And what I mean by that is that you and I can't allow ourselves to slip into that mentality that where we ask ourselves constantly of, of what's in it for me, or I don't like that, or, or why do they do that? The music's too loud, or why do they play secular music? Even in this current culture we find it, why are they waiting to open up? Why aren't things back to normal? Why do I have to wear a mask? All of these things. See, the sole reason we exist, the sole reason any church exists, it's for the sake of spreading the gospel. He's doing whatever it takes to make sure that Jesus gets made famous and that his way of life gets shared with as many people as possible. It's really not that complicated. That's also true for those of us who are following Jesus. Our primary objective becomes positioning ourselves to live the kind of life that points other people to Jesus. Here's a good one. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give any offense to the Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me, I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. See, Paul's really getting at the heart of what it is, this difference between making a point in life and making a difference. He's given us some really good advice. You should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. So what he's saying is, you got to actually learn what Jesus did, which that's easy to do in this setting, right? We've got more time on our hands than we've ever had before. We can study, we can think, we can learn, but it's not just learning what Jesus did. It's also doing what Jesus did. I've long argued that that is the chief problem with the church, is we know a whole lot about Jesus, but knowledge does not equal transformation. It's knowledge plus application that actually gets us where we need to be. It's not following Jesus out of convenience. It's not following Jesus when it fits my particular lifestyle or my particular ideology. What we gotta do is remind ourselves something that you already know, I bet. That if you're in a relationship with Jesus, I don't have to tell you this again. Following Jesus is not easy. Like if you're actually doing it, if you're trying to make the application in your everyday life, it requires some risk along the way. It requires a tremendous amount of sacrifice. There is a whole lot of struggle that you have to go through to follow Jesus. That's why Jesus himself said, if you wanna be my follower, you gotta deny yourself and you gotta pick up your cross and follow me. You gotta be willing to roll up your sleeves. You gotta get down in the trenches. You gotta do things you don't wanna do. And listen, I'll be honest, it's hard. There are a lot of days when my emotions get the best of me. There are a lot of days when I want to act on my feelings. There are a lot of days, y'all, when I'm driving up Pellissippi and I've had a long day and somebody cuts in front of me. I'd like to give them a gesture, right? There are moments when I've struggled with my kids or when I get frustrated on my job or, or when I just think about everything that's going on in the world. There are moments where it's hard to get a grip. But I keep reminding myself that God is pursuing me. God wants to be in a relationship with me. God wants my life to be different than it is now. And if Jesus can lay his life down for me, then maybe I can pump the brakes. Maybe I can catch my breath. Maybe I can think before I speak. Maybe I can just let things roll off my shoulder that aren't really that big of a deal. It doesn't mean that you gotta be perfect. And it doesn't mean that you can't fail. But what it does mean is you gotta keep putting one foot in front of the other. Listen, you can make all the points you wanna make and it will not matter. But you look around our world and you think about even in our community or the community where you live, you think about the people that are actually making a difference and you tell me the world's not changing. We only get one shot. You and I are not living in a dress rehearsal for what life is to come. This is the life we have. And what I found is that every single time I've managed to trust God more than my fear or to lean into God when I'm weak 
or to just accept the fact that Jesus' way is better than my way, the payoff of living a well-lived life has been a game changer. Y'all, we really can do this. It is possible. I will go to my grave believing that the church is the hope of the world. That when you look around our society, there is no other organization when it is functioning the way that God wants it to function that can do what the church can do. There's not a financial institution. There's not a governmental structure. There's not any kind of business forum that can do what the church can do. For only the church, through the power of the resurrected Jesus, has the ability to impact a human life and redirect a human destiny. And I don't know about y'all, but I hope that when I get to the end of my life and people gather at my funeral, whether that's two people or 500 people, I hope that they don't have to stand up and tell lies so that they can fill the time and make themselves feel good about a life that I didn't live. I hope that somebody will stand up and say, this guy was really quiet and he wasn't the best at what he did, but I'm standing here today as a living witness that he made a difference. See, I think that's what God's trying to communicate. I think that's the reason Jesus told this story. The younger son went out and he lived his life and he made some mistakes and yet his father welcomed him back home. The older brother got fired up about that because he felt like he wasn't being treated the same way. He had done everything the way he thought he was supposed to do it. He had followed all the rules. He dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and nobody ever took time to celebrate him. And he got his tail up on his shoulders and he confronts his father and he's like, what about me? How many of us today were asking that question, well, what about me? And what God is saying is, you're doing a great job, but you're already in the fold. We gotta focus on who's not at home. And when one comes home, we've gotta celebrate that because they weren't mistakers and they weren't failures. What he says is they were dead and they came back to life again. That's what our world needs is more dead people coming back to life again. Because here's the truth about you and about me and about every single human being. When our soul is broken, our life is broken. It's not just the addiction. It's not just the past. It's not just our failure. It's not just our mistake. It's the fact that our, that our soul is broken. And until our souls are healed, until we heed that call to come back home, our life is never going to be the way we want it to go. But the moment we find healing for our soul, we can stand up to the addiction. The moment the pieces of our broken soul get put back together, we can start to move beyond our past. The moment that we find the healing on the inside, that's the moment we can declare, I'm no longer gonna be a victim, but I'm gonna start walking in victory. Our world is desperate for it, and guess what? God has picked ordinary people just like you and just like me to be the conduit through which God's grace and God's mercy and God's compassion and God's healing, it just gets breathed out onto the world around us. It is possible for our world to be different. But we've got to hear the rally cry. And we've got to be willing to roll up our sleeves. And we've got to be willing to welcome home prodigal sons and daughters. Thanks for tuning in. I can't wait to see you guys next week. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. the chasm that lay between